Okay, sorry about that. I did from the beginning, but it didn't try. I'll try again. There we go. <laughs> okay, well, welcome everyone. I'm excited to share with you uh, a brand new presentation that I created uh, recently called, well, actually just for this event called Plant Power Protein, the most healthful protein sources for people and the planet. And uh, I'll begin with a very brief overview. We're going to start with a little bit of an introduction and a historical perspective on protein. Then we'll delve into some of the protein science definitions, a little bit of biochemistry, scratching the surface. Uh, we'll talk about amino acid classification, structure and function. We'll dive into a little bit about protein quality, looking at the definitions, assessment tools, and, uh, and specifically uh, plant protein quality. And then we'll discuss protein quantity. So essentially recommended intakes through the life cycle for athletes as well. And then we'll look at actual intakes and how we can ensure sufficient protein. And then we'll talk a little bit as well about soy safety. And I, I will then uh, talk a little bit about the advantages of animal or plant versus animal protein. And then we will conclude the presentation by talking about the benefits of plant protein beyond human health. So uh, first, a little bit of an introduction. Um, Benjamin Franklin once said there are two certainties in life, death and taxes. But for plant-based eaters, there is definitely one more. Getting asked the question, where do you get your protein? Uh, this cartoon um, by Bizarro Comics, uh, I just love. It's a, um, a little rodent asking a very large muscular gorilla, no meat at all. Are you sure you're getting enough protein? And the point being here that we is that we have a very strong cultural bias towards meat being the only real source of protein. Uh, few of us realize that plant foods provide ample protein for people. While legumes are the most concentrated plant protein sources, grains actually provide about half of the world's protein for people. I'm sorry, I'm just getting a little uh, box at the top here. Who can see this? I'm just going to try to move it. Oh, there. Okay. Uh, so let's let's talk a little bit about how animal protein acquired its health halo, if you will. If we look back at public health history, for a lot of years, hunger and malnutrition were the most serious public health nutrition concerns. Government policies were directed towards the elimination of hunger and deficiency diseases. And you can see that the advertisement said, drink more milk for your health and, you know, meat in the meal for health defense. Uh, these kinds of advertisements were very common uh, back in the day. Nutrition education campaigns were really in those days dominated by eat more messages and protein was a primary focus. As animal products were concentrated protein sources, they were considered a critical part of the solution. Protein quality assessment tools definitively favored animal products over plant foods. And so economic policies of national and international uh, governments and organizations sought to maximize meat and milk production to reduce malnutrition and uh, farmer subsidies and marketing support and price controls were all set in place. And many uh, people assumed it was a job pretty well, well done. Uh, diseases of nutritional deficiency diminished and the interests of the animal agriculture industry became very deeply entrenched in the economy. It appeared as though the job of improving health through nutrition 
had been pretty effectively accomplished. So animal products acquired a bit of a health halo. Meat became synonymous with good nutrition and big muscles, while dairy was associated with strong and healthy bones. But many people didn't, what many people didn't bargain for is that the eat more message uh, might backfire, and it did. While diseases of nutritional deficiency diminished, the eat more messages gave rise to another malnutrition menace called overconsumption. There are actually many faces of malnutrition. We, most of us, when we think of malnutrition, we think of hunger or undernutrition. We think of people in faraway countries who are starving. But there are other types of malnutrition, micronutrient deficiencies being one. And, and when it comes to micronutrient deficiencies, we often think of things like um, blindness caused by a lack of vitamin A, for example, or iron deficiency anemia called, caused by a lack of iron. The third major type of malnutrition is overconsumption. And overconsumption has become the new normal. Overconsumption now exceeds undernutrition as the number one form of malnutrition globally. Over 70% of American adults are either overweight or obese. Western diets that are rich in highly processed foods and animal products are the most strongly implicated. Diseases of overconsumption are responsible for about 70% of deaths globally. The lesson here is that good nutrition is about ensuring adequate nutrition at every stage of the life cycle, but it's also about minimizing the risk of obesity and chronic diseases that are associated with overconsumption. We know that there are a variety of eating patterns that can ensure sufficient nutrients, but those that are most effective at minimizing overweight and chronic disease risk are largely or exclusively plant-based. Let's move on to talk a little bit about protein science. <music>